Okay, guys, let's uh, let's start. There was a small small glitch here. Okay, so it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Akash Lau from Microsoft Research India. So Akash got his PhD from uh, University of Wisconsin with uh, uh, Tom Reps, and uh, for his work he actually won the uh, ACM Doctoral uh, the Sick Plan Doctoral Dissertation Award. Uh, since then he's been with Microsoft Research. He's done a lot of interesting work in program analysis, SMT. Um, so on. So, go ahead. Thank you for the introduction. I think the mic is on. It's not on. I think it'll turn on in a minute. If I just keep speaking, um, it will automatically turn on. The mute is off. Is off. Maybe the whole thing is. It is on. It says it's on. Yeah, mute is off. It work. It will work. No, it's not working. <laughs> I'm just speaking, not speaking into the mic properly. Now it's better. No, it's not better. The volume is too low. Should be good. Oh, yeah, it should be. All right. Finally, uh, now it might be a little loud. So welcome to my talk. Uh, let's get started finally. So this is joint work with Shaz. Um, it was presented recently at uh, at PLDI. So if you attended PLDI and you attended the session this was presented in, it might be a bit of a repeat. But um, okay, so it's a rather long long title. So let me uh, let me start by uh, giving some context, uh, 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 some setting for this work. And uh, the focus of my work recently has been on bug finding using what we call bounded verification. So in, in the context of uh, building automated program analysis tools, there have been several success stories, like the static driver verifier, Facebook infer that we heard yesterday. And one thing to note is mostly the success stories has been in finding bugs. Uh, and it's no surprise that people in the industry care about finding bugs. So. Uh, so, the, uh, so my work has been on designing analysis for finding bugs quickly, rather than waiting for them to fall out as a byproduct uh, when proof discovery fails. And bounded verification is a, a, um, is an idea that 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 captures this. And uh, what you do is you you identify a subset of program behaviors that you're going to analyze and you cover that subset as efficiently as you can and hope that most of the interesting bugs will lie in that subset. So that's what I mean by bounded verification. Um, so uh, this is uh, what I'm saying is I'm not the only one uh, uh, saying that bounded verification has been successful. If you look at all of the verifiers that competed in the software verification competition uh, this year, um, so they put out a report, and they for every tool, uh, they have they list the the kind of techniques used in that tool, and half of them use some kind of bounded model checking or bounded verification. Okay, so a lot of people have have realized this, and even in the uh, the same realization was there before in the hardware community, where so if you're verifying a circuit, a circuit is really if hardware is really a circuit in a loop, and what and uh, um, SAT techniques became very popular in analyzing one iteration of the loop. So if you get really good at analyzing bounded behaviors, eventually you get good at analyzing the, the actual problem that you care about. And uh, my own work, which is uh, uh, building this verifier called Coral, is now used and ships with the static driver verifier. So the standard approach in doing many of these bounded uh, analysis techniques is the following. You start with a program, and you start with a bound. So you assume that the bound is given to you by a user, maybe in terms of a number of loop iterations that you want to cover. And you start inlining all procedures in the program. So you know, we're thinking uh, single-threaded programs here, so <coughs> programs with multiple procedures, loops, and so on. And you start inlining all procedures in the program and up till you hit the bound. And what you end up with is a program with a single procedure and no loops and no recursion. 
And at that time, you do what is called a VC generation, or you tr encode all behaviors of that program into an SMT formula, and you give it to an SMT solver, and let it do what it does best. OK, and you, wh what you see is that they're actually, um, this is one of the reasons why the, 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 uh, the problem is actually has a double exponential complexity. So you pay one exponential when you inline. So if you inline all procedures, you get an exponential explosion. So you have an exponentially sized program. So this formula is exponentially sized in the, uh, uh, in the original program. And then you feed it to an SMT solver, which also has an exponential algorithm inside it, so you get a double exponential complexity. And, and so in our work, we try to address, uh, 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 address this complexity. So let's take a, a program, uh, let's, let's take a program with the following call graph. So you have procedures P0, P1, P2, and so on. And P0 calls P1 twice, so that's what these two arrows means. P1 calls P2 twice, and so on. And when you start inlining, this is where you see the exponential explosion. You'll create two copies of P1, you'll create four copies of P2, and in general, two to the i copies of Pi. Okay, so when you, in some sense, you're unfolding the call graph into a tree, and the tree is going to be exponentially sized in the original program. So in our work, roughly, what we're doing is we're not going to unfold the call graph to a tree, but rather to a DAG. The structure of the DAG is going to actually depend on the semantics of the program, and I'll explain that later. But the idea is that this can be exponentially more succinct than, than the tree-based uh, tree unfolding. And, um, uh, and this exponential improvement is realized in practice. So uh, at least so this is a micro benchmark that has the same call, call graph that was, uh, that was there on the last slide. So you have main main calls P0 twice, PI calls PI plus one twice, and so on, and there's an assertion in PN. And if you take this program and you run it through some of the standard bounded verifiers like CBMC and Coral, you get an exponential scalability. So this is on log scale, and as you increase the value of N, which is the depth of the call graph, you get exponential scalability. Um, uh, whereas in diagon lining, which is this, this line over here, you get linear scalability. Oh yeah, sorry, the timeout is 900 seconds. So when you hit the timeout, you flatten out, yeah. Okay, um, so the, the, I, the rest of the talk is gonna be follows. I'll formally define what the problem is and I'll get into uh, some background on doing VC generation. Um, uh, the way it is done, uh, some standard algorithms, the way it's done right now. And this, is, this part will be more like a, a tutorial. I'll, I'll go slowly over and co try to cover these algorithms and then get into DAG inlining. All right, so this actually kind of justifies why we had that very long title. Um, so we define a hierarchical program as a sequential program without loops and recursion. Okay, so the program can have multiple procedures, but no loops, no recursion. And reachability modular theories is the problem of finding a terminating execution in a program whose operational semantics can be encoded in decidable logic. So what I mean by that is um, uh, there is a way of taking every program statement and encoding it in SMT, for example. Um, so this is the language uh, that, we, that we consider. So you have variables uh, of certain type. You can have uninterpreted functions, f. Uh, you have procedures. Procedures have bodies with the usual control flow and commands being assignments, assumes, and procedure calls. Okay? And the, the, the kind of restriction here is that your expressions have to have some encoding in, in SMT so that we can uh, uh, do VC generation for them. And what, I mean, this really means that you have to pick your battles on how you're actually going to model language semantics. So there are things that you might not want to do, like re reason over floating point computations, so you have to decide upfront that you're going to make them unprinted, for example, or you're going to treat them as reals. But so these are decisions you take upfront, and after that is, is where our analysis kicks in. Yes? So, um, yeah, yeah, so I mean, these are our formulas. So hierarchical programs do not have any rule loops, and RMT you can define for 
any program. And what we're going to solve is RMT on hierarchical programs. In that case, I mean, we have to have a, so I mean, even recursion is not allowed. So no loops, no recursion. Yes. So that means you just unfold everything, right? Uh, the, the way, yeah, so the way you encode programs as a hierarchical one is, I mean, you have a bound on the number of repetitions you want. So there are some tricks on doing it easily, but that's kind of what I'm discussing here. Okay, so, uh, so one thing to note is that the way I defined RMT is that I am interested in finding uh, terminating executions, but that's kind of like s um, s the same thing as finding assertion failures. And this is just a, a, a one slide uh, justification of why these problems are equivalent. So let's say I have a program that has some assertions in it. So there's a, uh, there's a program and there's some assertions that appear somewhere in the program, right? And there's a simple rewriting to a program without assertions, such that finding a terminating execution here is the same thing as finding an assertion violation here. Okay, so how does this work? Uh, well, it's kind of easy. So you introduce a Boolean variable ERR, and at program entry, you set it to true. And the only way you can exit from main is if this variable is false, okay? So the only way of finding a terminating execution is one in which ERR is set to false, and it, it's set to false only when an assertion fails. So it kind of simplifies the description of VC generation if you just focus on terminating executions. So um, solving RMT in hierarchical problem programs is decidable. It's NEXP time hard, which is why you have this doubly exponential complexity, where at least it's not undecidable. And, uh, and this problem, as you would guess, is has direct ap applications to bounded verification. So if you want to analyze all program behaviors up to a certain number of loop iterations, it's the same thing as doing RMT in hierarchical programs. Okay, so even though, I mean, our focus is on bounded verification, I mean, this is not completely orthogonal to doing unbounded verification. So imagine you have a setting where you, you're as a programmer, a programmer gives you loop invariance but doesn't necessarily supply any prepost conditions. Right, then we're checking that those loop invariants are inductive is also like solving RMT in hierarchical programs, right? Okay, so let's look at uh, VC generation. So we are going to start by solving RMT on single procedure programs. I'll describe that first, and then uh, show the generalization to multiple procedure programs in which I'll use tree inlining, the standard exponential explosion, and then get into diagonal lining. Okay, so let's say I have this single procedure F. It takes uh, W as input, returns X and Y, and it does some stuff, okay? And what I'm going to do as VC generation is that given this F, I'm gonna generate a formula phi over W, X, and Y, such that the formula is satisfiable uh, if and only if F, W can return X, Y. So this Z is a, is a typo, so ignore that part. So the formula is satisfiable if and only if the procedure has a terminating execution on that input and output. Okay, and once you have this theorem, then finding a terminating execution just is the same thing as checking satisfiability. So how do we generate this VC? Uh, here's one way to do it. So there are several ways. Um, uh, let me just explain one simple way of doing it. So the first thing you do is uh, uh, a single static assignment. So this is something you'll find in your compiler's textbook. And it's a rewriting where, uh, so after the rewriting, every variable has a single assignment, an exact one assignment in the program, okay? And the way you do it is that you just uh, rename your variable. So if you have a, a assignment x equals x plus one, it gets replaced by something that looks like this. So the value coming in is x1, and the, and the value going out is stored in x2. And what you have to be careful is that when control comes together, so here the value of x can either come from this block L2 or come from this block L1. So in SSA, the, in SSA terminology, this is where you introduce a phi node that says the new value of x is either x2 or x3, depending, depending on where control came from, right? And so in, in verification, we don't really like uh, 
SP functions, so there's a way of rewriting it. So you knock it off and instead replace it with assignments. So this saying x4 came from either x2 or x3, so you knock this off and you actually replace it with assignments from where x4 actually came from, right? So if you came from here, then the value of x4 was obtained from x3, so you have this assignment x4 equals x3, or it could have come from x2 and you put the assignment over there. Okay, so now this, this fee functions have gone. We don't have to think about what fee functions mean. Okay, so now in this program, this is not exactly SSA because you have you do have multiple assignments of variables, so there are two assignments to x4. But what you can convince yourself is that on any execution, there is exactly one assignment to every variable. Okay, so I've done that. And now when you've done that form, you do what is called pacification, you can convert all assignments to assumes. Okay, when you really only have one assignment to a variable, that is the only definition of what value the variable carries. So it's really like a constraint or like an assume statement, okay? So all I did from, from this slide to here is that I converted every assignment to an assume. Yes? What does this uh, multi-level go-to mean? Is it non-deterministic choice or? Oh yeah, sorry, sorry, I didn't describe that. Yes, yes. it's a non-deterministic choice. Okay. Okay, so this is what is called pacified form. Uh, and if you're familiar with using Boogie, and this is exactly how Boogie does VC, VC, VC. Uh, Once you do that, now let's, uh, you know, we, we're already getting to a more logical form, right? We've eliminated assignments. Now let's start writing constraints. So for every block, I'm gonna write a constraint, which is a conjunction of all assumes that occur on that block. So I have four blocks here. So for the constraint on the start block, is, so I only have one assume here, so it's gonna be this guy, y1 equals x1 plus w. On L1 I have two, so it's a conjunction of both of them, so x2 equals x1 plus one, and x4 equals x2, and so on. Okay, so for the four blocks I have four constraints. And so in order to, this is how we will do the VC generation. So we're gonna introduce a Boolean constant for every block L. And in some sense, this block says does control reach block L. Okay? Now define E of L to be uh, the constraint CL. So CL is the constraint on the block. So BL equals CL if L uh, ends in a return. Or if there is a control transfer from block L, then it's a disjunction over all Boolean variables which are successors of L. All right? Best understood through an example. So for this program, the equation, so E is E stands for equation, on the start block is B start equals the constraint on the block, and you have to take one of the successors. So what this means is that if you want to find a terminating execution and you are programmed as at uh, the start block, then you must satisfy the constraint on that block, and you must take one successor of that block. And if you take a successor, let's say you take the successor BL1, so that means you set this variable to true, that means you must satisfy the constraint on block L1, and you must take a successor of block L1, which is L3, and so on. Okay, so your VC is just a conjunction of these equations, and you, in, ex, uh, and you additionally say that your execution starts in the start block. Okay, so this is the VC for this procedure. Uh, this formula, and you can you can show that this formula is satisfiable if and only if there's a terminating execution of this procedure. Okay, so hopefully this is. So let's get to multiple procedures. Um, you know, one technique is just to inline all the procedures and just apply the algorithm that I described previously, uh, but what I'm going to do instead is to do the inlining at a VC level, okay? And this is kind of setting up for, for what I want to do. So now I've simplified the program a little bit. So I have two procedures, and F calls G twice, okay? So there's one call here, there's another call here. Okay, now I want to do VC generation. So the first thing I'll do is I'll knock off the calls and I replace them with assume statements. Okay, so I uh, imagine fresh Boolean variables, uh, M0 and M1, 
and the first call is knocked off, and I instead put a placeholder saying that you know if m0 is true, I must remember to do this call. And if m1 is true, I must remember to do this call. Okay? So I replace call sites with assumes, and now I do my VC generation. Okay? So because I've eliminated all procedure calls, uh, I can do VC generation uh, the way I described previously. So the VC for f will look something like this. It's, it's going to be a simple formula like that because either you take this branch and you assume C and M0, or you take this branch and you assume not C and M1, okay? So that's what the VC of F will look like. And the VC of G is simply says the value of B is A plus one, right? So B only increments the input, so B equals A plus one. That's the VC of G, okay? So we're not quite done yet because we have to say what M0 and M1 is. Now we have to start connecting the fact that if I set M0 to true, then I must, uh, must execute this call. And the way to do it is the, is the following. So now there, with every procedure, you introduce more Boolean variables, in this case, Ni. Ni is going to be associated with every procedure instance. So that means there's going to be a variable N0 that represents whether control starts at F, and there are going to be variables n1 for this call and n2 for this call, all right? And this is how you do the VC generation. So you say execution starts in f, so n0 must be true. And if n0 is true, then the VC of f must be true. So this is the VC of f, okay? And uh, now when I take m0, if I must execute the procedure call. So the m if I m0 is true, then n1 must be true and I must equate my formals to actuals. Okay, so the formal here is V1, and so v, I must pass the value of V1 to A, so I have this V1 equals A1 constraint, and whatever this guy returns, which is B, must be equated to R, so R equals V1. Okay, and this N1 says, if N1 is set to true, then I must take the VC of G, and this is, the, this is a VC of G. And similarly, I have a call of M1, and M1 implies this guy, where N2 is going to be another copy of the VC of G. Okay, so this program has two call sites, and for every call site, uh, I have to inline a copy of G, which, so, so, the, so the VC of G shows up twice. Okay, and so now this is the formula, and again, you can convince yourself that this formula is satisfiable if and only if F has a terminating execution. All right. So now I'm able to do VC generation of multiple procedures. But if I follow this style, I'll end up doing the tree inlining. Okay. So this VC I can pictorially represent as, you know, I have a VC of F and it uses the VC of G twice. So that's the tree. All right. So now, uh, now let me start talking about tag inlining. So for that, I need to define uh, you know, uh, uh, a little bit of notation. So um, by a dynamic uh, procedure instance, I mean a procedure that is qualified by its call stack. Okay. So here I have three procedures, main, baz, bar, and main calls bar, uh, uh, bar calls foo, and so on. And so there are two dynamic instances of foo, depending on where it is called from. Okay. So it's foo qualified by the call stack, which is AC. So either I do this call and this, this call, or I do BD. So I do this call, and I, then I do this call. Right? So there are two instances of foo in this program. And I say that the procedure instances are disjoint if they cannot be taken on the same execution. And this is the main thing that the DAG inlining is going to rely on. Okay? So in this program, there is no way these two dynamic instances of foo can be taken on the same execution. Right, because of this if star. They're, they're on different branches of ifs and else. All right, so here's the theorem. Um, if any two disjoint instances of the same procedure can be merged together when inlining, that's where the merging in the DAG comes in. So in this program, I was carefully chosen to, to, uh, uh, to make the two instances of G be disjoint, right? 
So the standard inlining was ending up with a uh, thing that looked like this. In DAG inlining, we'll end up looking with a DAG like this. Because the two instances of D, G are disjoint, I will create a VC in which only one copy of the VC of G is there. Okay, so let's look at what this VC will look like. So this is the VC from before that we uh, did a few slides ago, and this is what the DAG inlining VC will look like. Now, because, so if you want to contrast this and this, what has happened is here I had two variables, N1 and N2, that implied different copies of the VC of G. But because these two instances of G are disjoint, that they cannot be taken on the same execution, I'm actually going to share that VC. So instead of having two variables, n1 and n2, I only have one variable, n1, and so n2 has gone, right? So both m0 and m1, here they were implying n1 and n2, but here both of them will imply n1, okay? So in some sense, both these call sites, m0 and m1, are pointing to the same instance of G. Okay, and these two formulas are actually equivalent. And the way to prove it is that you can do some simplification depending on when C is true or not. Both of them will simplify to a formula that looks like this. All right. Now, uh, in, in, uh, so this is, is kind of like what the algorithm looks like. Uh, you construct your VC on the fly. So if you have a program, you start at main, so you create the VC of main. But now you have call sites that go out of main, so maybe main calls bar and bas and you start inlining them by creating copies of those uh, procedures. So here I have uh, uh, call sites uh, bar and baz, so I'm gonna inline bar, and maybe that exposes some call site of foo, and I'm gonna inline foo, and then maybe transitively inline everything else that foo calls, okay? And now I uh, inline the other call site baz, I create a copy of foo, and you know, if I were doing tree inlining, I'll go create um, uh, everything that foo calls again. Okay, but in DAG inlining, at this point, when I'm about to inline a particular call site, foo, I check if there is an existing instance that this call is disjoint with. So if I find that this call site is disjoint with that guy, right, so these two are disjoint, then I just simply make this guy point to that one. And at that point, I'm done. Yes? What goes wrong if you don't enforce the straightness? You get completeness or not so much. Uh, but if you use this you get both complete. It's sound incomplete. It's equivalent. Okay. So at this point, I just make it point to that copy of foo, and then I'm, I'm I'm done. I don't actually have to go and inline all everything else that foo foo calls because that's already there in my VC. Okay. So because you know this bubble can be as large as you can imagine it to be, so the savings with that inlining can be as large as you can imagine it to be. Okay, and this applies recursively. So you, I mean, you don't have to stop with just one inlining. You can keep inlining. So there may be other instances inside here that you find disjoint, and if so, you can make things uh, be shared inside here as well. And the th uh, um, so, so, so let me build up to the theorem. We call uh, such a DAG to be consistent if for every node n, all configurations represented by that node are mutually disjoint. Okay, so if I pick a node here, this guy actually represents four configurations. This is one, this is another, this is another, this is another, right? If all those four are disjoint, then I call this DAG consistent. And the theorem is that if, as long as the DAG is consistent, I get an, uh, I can produce a VC that is equivalent to, to the original tree inlining version. Yes? Ah, very good, very good. So if you want to do it optimal, it, 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 it becomes difficult. It reduces to graph coloring. So let me, let me try to, so there are, yeah, so you're right. There, are, there can be lots of choices of what to inline and what to merge with. So let's look at this. Uh, so this is a call graph. Uh, sorry, not, not a call graph. This is a control flow graph. So a procedure that calls foo four times. And the call sites are A, B, C, and D. Okay, so there are four call sites, and now let's, so, I mean, when I'm doing my DAG inlining, when I have inline, so this procedure is called main, so when I have main, 
I have four call sites exposed for foo, A, B, C, and D. Okay, so now what do I merge with? So let's look at, uh, so let me build a graph, which I call a conflict graph, and there is an edge between two call sites if they're not disjoint. Okay, so A and C are not disjoint because clearly there's a path that takes both A and C, so there's an edge here. A and B are disjoint because if I take A, I cannot take B. If I take B, I cannot take A. And similarly, C and D are disjoint. Okay, so now I have choices of what I can merge first. If I end up merging B and C, so now B and C are disjoint. If I end, end up merging them, and so I reuse the same copy of foo for both B and C, at this point, I'm done. It's kind of like I took these two nodes and I uh, clubbed them together into this guy. Now everything has a conflict with everything else. Nothing is disjoint anymore, so I cannot merge anymore. But on the other hand, if I merged A and B, I could still merge C and D. So if I merge A and B, C and D are still disjoint, and merge, I can merge C and D, and I end up with more sharing. Okay, So you have to be careful of what you inline first. And uh, this actually uh, this shows why you reduce to graph coloring. Bec so the, 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 the way to do it optimally is to take all your call sites and you color this conflict graph with the minimum colors possible. And then everything with the same color, you have to merge it together. Because okay, so the fewer colors you use, the more merging you're going to get. Um, uh, so, uh, so we have efficient procedures for deciding when two uh, dynamic instances are disjoint. I'll actually not go into this. It's not, it's not very important. But it's efficient that we have something that's linear in the size of the uh, call stack. And then we do not do graph coloring. Turns out it's a cost that we really don't have to pay. Yes? Yeah, yeah. So that, that's a good point. We don't do uh, disjointness, disjointness exactly. We only look at the control flow. So what we do is we construct a push down system, and then uh, the queries are only answered over the push down, push down system. So it's an approximation to actual disjointness. And uh, even in uh, merging, we, we don't try to be optimal. So instead of graph coloring, we, we employ a, a greedy gar graph coloring algorithm. Uh, uh, so in the worst case, the greedy algorithm can be quite off. Uh, the optimal algorithm, but in practice, it turns out that this algorithm was only 8% of the optimal. Um, and so, so we go ahead and use it because, I mean, we don't want to be spending too much time in solving some uh, orthogonal problems rather than actually having the SMT do all of the work. Okay, so overall, what we found is, uh, uh, so, so we have, you can, you will find these algorithms in the paper of deciding whether two configurations are disjoint, whether a given DAG is consistent, uh, how do we do graph coloring and so on? And I at the end of the day, uh, only less than 0.5% of the time is actually spent in, in doing all of this. Because I mean, this, this, all this is overhead that you don't pay in tree inlining. So we want this overhead to be as small as possible. Okay, so let me get into some experiments. So we uh, compared against tree inlining. Um, with benchmarks that were chosen from uh, the static driver verifier. So all the benchmarks are uh, Windows device drivers uh, with various kinds of properties that we check over device drivers. Um, Coral is currently based on tree inlining, and so we implemented DAG inlining, DAG inlining inside it. And one thing to note is that uh, you know, Coral uses tree inlining, but it uses several optimizations o over tree inlining. Um, so we compare with those optimizations in place. Um, so, yeah, so all the drivers we took total uh, cumulatively are more uh, about 800,000 lines of code. Uh, and the time it took to generate the tables was uh, over a month. Over a month of machine time that we paralyzed, so we didn't really take a month. So this is a kind of a limit comparison. So what if you inline, if you did full tree inlining and you did full DAG inlining, how the sizes compare? across various benchmarks. So it, there is about, so this is log scale, so there's about uh, one order of magnitude difference 
in the tree inline version versus the DAG inline version. So the DAG inline version can be an order of magnitude more compact. Right. But as you can see, the sizes uh, uh, go to up to a million. And there is no way um, that we're going to fit VCs that big uh, into a theorem prover. Okay. So that's why, I mean, even in tree inlining, Coral does several optimizations, and we'll see that in the table that comes after this slide. Um, this is actually a point I made before. So we did comparisons of optimal merging against greedy merging, and then uh, we were 8% off the optimal. Uh, you didn't have to look at all the numbers. Okay, so here's a summary of the results. So there are two versions of the algorithms depending on the optimizations that you have in place. Now, the tree one is the one that uses tree inlining. The DAG one is the one that uses DAG inlining. And uh, this, uh, this version is what currently ships uh, with the static driver verifier. Okay, so in a each case, so the comparisons are tree one versus DAG one and tree two versus DAG two. And in, either ca in each case, we give the number of timeouts. Um, so DAG inlining had fewer timeouts. We give the number of bugs that we found. So DAG inlining finds more bugs. The number of procedures inlined on average. So you can see that this number is much, much smaller than a million, right? Because of all the optimizations that are there in place. And uh, DAG inlining is three times, uh, uh, around three times more compact compared to tree inlining. And the time it took. So DAG inlining was about twice as fast than tree inlining. Okay, and this, uh, the same comparison goes for, for both of these guys. So, you know, in conclusion, you, f you find more bugs and we find them in less time and almost twice as fast as the production system. Okay, and this is the same comparison in, as a scatter plot. Um, um, so this is a comparison on some of the harder instances, 619 instances. Um, uh, so there's a, so these are the same numbers. So there's a reduction in timeouts, and there's a significant speed up in many instances, but there's also a slowdown in some instances. So anything in this part of the triangle means that DAG inlining was faster. So these are all the timeouts that we eliminated, but it's not that we were universally better. So there are instances where we slowed down. In fact, instances where DAG inlining would timeout where tree inlining would succeed. So this is to say that I mean, we were, we we're not a universal optimization because finally at the end of the day you're giving all of these formulas to an SMT solver and what matters is the time that uh, the SMT solver takes. So DAG inlining can ensure that we produce smaller, more compact formulas, but that doesn't necessarily imply that the solver is going to solve them faster. Um, so, the, so we do pay that cost sometimes. And so this is the same comparison in the other versions with different kinds of optimizations, and then we have a similar, uh, similar comparison here as well. Yes. Um, so that's, this is a point to ask the question I've been wondering about as you went along. It's clear that you have a space reduction here, but um, could you explain if there's any change in actually the search space that's going on? Otherwise, can you comment on what the actual reasons for, for the timing changes are? So the formula is definitely more compact. The sizes of the models are also smaller with DAG inlining because when you merge, you just have fewer variable instances that your model uh, that your model is over. Presumably, if you had one section was disjoint from another, all the variable the other variables that would have been replicated are no longer matter. Only one set of them matters. Right, so it's whether the theorem prover can figure that out automatically or whether you enforce it, right? So uh, that's kind of the difference. If the uh, verifier is able to learn a lemma saying that, oh, these guys are disjoint, there's no way I have to reason over these parts of the programs together, then it could uh, um, get the same benefits of DAG inlining. But you know, we kind of figure it out ourselves and tell the verifier that, look, don't, you don't have to do all that work. It's like figuring out higher level information and encoding it into the, into the formula so that the theorem prover doesn't have to reverse engineer it. Um, so in summary, what I presented is 
I made a case that uh, reachability in hierarchical programs is fundamental to doing bounded verification. Uh, standard tree inlining is exponentially, can, be ex can have an exponential blow up that DAG inlining tries to address. All right, so thank you for your attention. So maybe kind of related to the previous question. So at the beginning you said the SMT solver is exponential in the size of the problem. So then on the one hand, I would kind of expect it to be worth spending the time making the merging as optimal as possible. Right? I mean, maybe even 8% makes a big difference. On the other hand, the numbers that you show seem to suggest it's not really the case. Right? I mean, you, you have already cases where you're three or four times smaller but you're only twice as fast. I mean, twice as fast is good, of course, but it's not exponential. So do you have, I mean, maybe that's related to your answer to the previous question, but it seems not to really be the case that there's this exponential relationship. Right, we've been trying to study this question. I mean, even here, there are other instances I mean, where we're seeing slowdowns. So we're trying to answer the question, what kind of mergings actually end up hurting the solver? But it's kind of very difficult. So these the SMT solvers have so many optimizations in place, it's really difficult to predict how they're going about solving a formula. So we really don't have control over that, but we're slowly trying to examine that question. You, just to ask another quick question, if you had a lot of computing power available, which I guess you guys do, does it make sense to just run many different strategies? I mean, I guess you can run many instances of the tool, right? So you could do the merging and not do the merging and do the optimal merging and yeah, yeah, sure, sure. see who finds bugs. Sure. And, and for a while we have actually multiple uh, engines uh, running together, um, okay. not just different instances of the engine. Thanks. Prints by 10, factor 10, for example, on the slide. But if I uh, remember correctly, it was not giving the size of the formula, but the number of inlines that you did. So it could be that you have had very small fashion that you inline and just the size of the whole the, the size of the whole formula just shrinks by perhaps also a factor of two only. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that, that that's First true. Uh, we couldn't measure the size of the formula itself. So for some reason we didn't do it. But yeah, I should have that data available somewhere. So one aspect of the presentation puzzles me. So you started by motivating the ideas with uh, what happens with static single assignment form of, of local variables. But what you only need for computing efficient verification conditions is dynamic single assignment form, right? It's enough if you have on each path at most one assignment to a variable and you can pacify it that way and that's good enough. And in a sense you do the same thing with methods, right? So, I mean, in a sense you just say I can reuse the same variables if on each path I have only one such such instance. So can you comment on that? I mean, if you had looked at the problem from that angle to begin with, would that have changed the situation? Um, so you have uh, you know multiple copies of G and then you end up using the same variables in both copies. Yeah, I suppose that's one way to look at it. Um, um, uh, I guess that the, the the, the, the trick you still have to play is, is, is what happens when you uh, start merging and you want to do more mergings. That is the part that you still have to be careful about in the way that, that we were. Um, so if you have merging here and you have, then you need some algorithms to figure out whether you can do merging here. So the theorem that you can only merge these disjoint instances becomes slightly involved when you have transitive relations. So that part you still have to be careful about, but you could, I guess you could imagine it as a, as a way of reusing variables. Uh, so in your example, so the uh, duplicated, uh, uh, duplicated versions, they all return to the same place. What do you do um, with the return address basically? of the calls? Do you have jump table, uh, sort of simulated jump tables to? So that part is kind of taken care uh, by how the VC generation works. So it doesn't matter where you're returning. Um, and 
pull that slide up again. Um, here, right? Uh, so, so the way we do it is that you know, these calls are knocked off and replaced by Boolean variables. And now when you do VC generation, the VC generation is going to figure out um, um, uh, how the control flows. So, so in some sense, so this is this, the way the VC generation work is kind of like a separation of concerns. So you say, I'm not going to treat the semantics of the procedure calls right now. All I know is that when the call returns, it returns here. So you replace it with a Boolean variable, and that guy's responsibility is when this, uh, this guy is set, you have to satisfy the semantics of the call. So when you knock them, knock them off and you have these assume statements, when you do VC generation, it'll take care of the control flow graph of this program. So all you need to know is that the call returns where it started. I hope that answers your question. Shaz once mentioned to me that merging in the non-disjoint case actually makes things harder for the SMT solver. Right? Because you sort of have the constraint that at two different call sites, the input and output values yes. have to be the same. The same, yes. So did you ever find any cases where non-disjoint non -disjoint merging was actually useful in terms of bug finding? Ah, uh, it, uh, I mean, yeah, we, we try doing it mostly because we had bugs in our algorithm that would just merge non-disjoint instances. Um, it really didn't have help bug finding because um, exactly, I mean, when it forces uh, the behaviors of those non-disjoint instances to be the same, it forces it to be the same to the last bit because the entire heap is represented as maps and even the contents of the map have to be the same. So even though all those behaviors are redundant, it really doesn't uh, it doesn't show up. So the formula just becomes unsatisfiable at that point. Yeah. Yeah.